Well, good morning. What a joy and a privilege it is to gather together to worship, to hear the testimonies of what God is doing. It really is quite a privilege to be part of a church where the Spirit of God is at work so mightily changing uh, the lives of sinners. And we get to watch that, we get to be, experience that, we get to be a part of that. And, uh, and what a joy to think that we have so many people that want to be baptized because they're following Christ and the work that God has done and continues to do through his word here at Desert Hills. Well, this morning we are continuing our series entitled Holiness, the Forgotten Attribute of God. Holiness is central to who God is, uh, but it has largely been forgotten in churches today. Now, when I say that holiness has been forgotten, I, I don't mean that people are unaware intellectually that God is holy. We understand that uh, the church intellectually knows the Bible says God is holy. Uh, worship songs that are sung at churches all over this nation have the word holy in them, and they sing them week in and, and week out. When I say that holiness, the holiness of God, is God's forgotten attribute, I mean that people do not understand what it means that God is holy, or they have forgotten the significance of it, or they treat God as if he were not holy. One example of this that we can look around and see commonly is the way that people pray to God. Uh, contemporary prayers in, in the church today often sound like somebody who is speaking to God as if he were a buddy, a peer, uh, somebody who is their equal, as if he has no holiness or as if his holiness is of no real concern. In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12, Paul tells us that in Christ we have boldness and confident access to the Father. And such statements in the New Testament, wonderful as they are, often are misunderstood by people as if it means that we come into God's presence as if we are his equals. Confidence in prayer does not mean a lack of reverence. Boldness in prayer does not mean a lack of awe for God. My children can come to me with any request, with boldness and with confidence because I am their father. But as with any earthly father who understands his role, they cannot come to me disrespectfully. They cannot come to me with their requests as if I were their peer. Uh, my, my children may not come to me and say, hey, Rob. <laughs> that will cause a stoppage in the conversation. No, dad, and maybe for this conversation, sir. There's always a certain level of respect, a, a distinct uh, distance between a father and his children because of reverence and respect. And if that is true of earthly fathers who are not holy in themselves, how much more so is it true of us with our heavenly father who is not just holy, but who is holy, holy, holy. This is commonly overlooked, forgotten, or ignored to make God seem more approachable, to make people who come into the church more uh, familiar with God, to, to feel less intimidation by God, to make church and the gospel and God seem easier, as if God were down on our level. And we saw last week how this permeates so much of the evangelical world today and, and, I, and how other pastors and theologians have sounded the alarm over these same concerns we're addressing in this series. We've also seen how dreadful the consequences are when we forget God's holiness. And so we are dealing with something that is of utmost importance in a time when it is so unpopular to do so. We spent the majority of our time last week considering what happens when creatures encounter God in his holiness. And we noted that even the holy angels with their creaturely holiness, when they're in the presence of the holy God, are in awe of God and his holiness because he is the creator and they are creatures. And his holiness is so transcendent that they stand in awe of God even though they have never sinned and they are holy as God's creatures. 
Further, we saw what happens when sinners encounter this holy God. And when sinners come into the presence of this holy God, they are utterly undone by God. Moses and Isaiah and Peter, they all had the same response to God and his holiness. They saw the depth of their own sinfulness. They saw the reality like never before that they deserved condemnation because of their sins against this holy God. And they expressed fear and dread until the grace of God was revealed. The grace of God did not remove the fear and awe from Moses and Isaiah and Peter. But it redirected it. Now it was a fear and awe of God that was expressed in worship, knowing they had been forgiven, knowing they had been accepted by God. But they still feared him. They still reverenced him. They desired to be near him instead of to run away from him. And yet that desire to be near God was always accompanied by a reverence and awe of God. This is what happens whenever a sinner truly encounters the true and living God. His sins are exposed. He recognizes that he stands justly under the wrath of God for his sins. And he knows that his only hope is that this holy God would show mercy and grace to forgive his sins and justify him with a righteousness that meets the requirements of God's holy law. The gospel tells us that this holy God gave his son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but would receive eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ. And this provokes a central, critical, the most important question that stands before each one of us today. Have you encountered this holy God? Have you had your sins exposed? Do you know that you deserve his judgment upon you and eternal punishment in hell because you have violated his holy standard. And have you looked to the cross of Christ for your only hope to be delivered from God's wrath that you so rightfully deserved is all of your faith in Christ crucified and risen from the dead to save you from the wrath of God and give you the gift of eternal life. If you have never recognized your sinfulness before God and turned away from that sin to faith in Christ, I plead with you not to leave here today until you know for certain that God has delivered you from condemnation through the blood of his son. Now this week we want to answer a very important question. What does the Bible mean when it says that God is holy? We've seen what happens when sinners encounter the holy God. But what does it mean in the Bible when it says that God is holy? Why do we respond to God in this way when we encounter him? What is it about God that provokes the angels to cry to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Interestingly, the Bible uses the word holy and its related terms over 500 times. But it never defines it. And so we have to discover its meaning by extrapolating it from various contexts and different texts throughout the Bible. And when we do that, we begin to see that God's holiness has a very clear and distinct meaning in Scripture. And I want to show you three ways that God's holiness is manifested from God's word this morning. Number one, God's holiness is manifest in his incomparable preeminence. His incomparable preeminence. Theologians have a number of different terms they use for this aspect of God's holiness. Uh, they'll talk about his majesty, his exaltedness, in relationship to created things, his otherness. Uh, this speaks to the distinction between God and everything that God has made when it is used in the context of creation. Of course, God is holy apart from creation. Before God ever created anything, God was holy. And when we, uh, when we think about God and his holiness apart from creation, it speaks to his greatness, his transcendence, his majesty, his exaltedness. And you say, you just used a thesaurus and looked up a lot of different terms this week. Well, that's because we're grasping for language to define something, to describe something that goes beyond our ability to truly comprehend. 
Uh, We're just piling up words to try to get a sense of the greatness and the majesty of the holiness of God. Uh, Perhaps we could put it like this. God's holiness is his majesty, and his holiness is seen within creation by his uniqueness and his separation from all that he has created. His holiness is his intrinsic majesty. And that majesty is seen in the fact that God is separate and God is distinct from all of creation. This word holy is derived from a word that means to cut or to separate. And so the idea of God's holiness is that God is separate from us. Or we could put it another way. There is nothing in creation that is like God. There is nothing we can use in creation and say God is like this thing. And really grasp the essence of who God is and what he is as holy. Let's look at a few passages of scripture to help shed some light on this. Look at Exodus 15. Exodus 15, verse 11. Moses and the sons of Israel are praising God. And they're praising him for his holiness in this verse. They say, who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Awesome in praises, working wonders. Now, now I want you to note that Moses and the sons of Israel recognize there are two things to say about God's holiness in this verse. You see in verse 11, they call him holiness, majestic in holiness. And that's the first thing they use to describe his holiness. He is majestic. He is glorious. He is royal. This speaks to God's preeminence, that he is awesome and fearsome and and powerful and exalted and sovereign. He has majesty as God. And then second, they say, who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? And, And here they repeat this phrase, who is like you, O Lord? In other words, there's no one like the Lord. He's completely without peer, without equal. He is incomparable. You could take all the gods that people have invented over all the centuries and all the millennia, and you can stack them all up against Yahweh, the God of Israel. None of them are on the same level. None of them are in the same class. None of them are his peers or his equals. You could take mighty warriors, great kings, vast armies, and powerful nations and try to measure all of them against God, but they can't be measured against God. God is so majestic in holiness, there is no comparison, no matter how many created things and how much created power and majesty you, you stack up, none of it compares to God. There is nothing like God. Now this verse defines God's holiness as his incomparable preeminence for us in the rest of Scripture. Whenever we come across this idea, it is connected to Exodus 15, 11, And even if the word holy isn't used, the idea is when God is like nothing and no one and stands alone, that God is holy. That's what the biblical writers are saying. Hannah recognizes the same thing. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, Hannah is praising God. For hearing her prayer. And she says in verse 2, There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one beside you. Nor is there any rock like our God. Now notice again the significance of God's holiness in terms of him being incomparable. Without peer and without equal. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides him. There is no other rock like our God. You can try to compare idols to God, but all comparisons fail. God stands alone. He is utterly unique. He is in a class all by himself. He has no equals, no peers, no one on his level. That means he is exalted far above all gods, all people, all nations, indeed all of creation. For there is no rock like our God. There is no power like our God has. He is utterly unique in every way. Now, perhaps no one in the Bible speaks as eloquently of God's holiness and his his incomparable preeminence as the prophet Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollows, in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales? Or who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? 
With whom did he consult? And who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. And are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? I love how this begins by offering us to compare things to God. The prophet begins by inviting a comparison. Who who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? He goes through all these things that God has done. And the more questions that he asks and the more categories he opens up and says, well, compare God to this and compare this about God and compare that about God. The more he does that, the more obvious it becomes that there is no one like God in any category. God is in a class by himself. And so the prophet says in verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? And who are you going to bring next to God? Who are you going to measure next to God? And the rhetorical question is answered very clearly with no one and nothing. He goes on. He's not done. Verse 19. As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And the justice due me escapes the notice of my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Notice how Isaiah shifts in this section to talking about God's exaltedness and his preeminence over creation. He sits above the circle of the earth. He reduces human rulers to nothing. When God looks down at humanity, he is so high that we all are like a bunch of little jumping grasshoppers on the the face of the earth. And then the question comes again in verse 25. To whom then will you liken me that I would be his equal? Who's on that level? Isaiah then asks in verse 26. Have any of my readers created any stars lately? You ever done that? You ever kept the stars in the heavens? In their position where they're supposed to be? And then he talks about God's incomparable majesty and his strength. He says, look at human beings, the strongest human beings, young men, powerful warriors, vigorous young men. You know what happens to them after enough time? They get tired. You can't even compare a strong young man to God because God never gets tired. And God has so much power, so much energy, so much strength that when people get tired, God gives them strength if they wait on him. There's no one like God in his majestic holiness. No one has power like his. No one has sovereignty like his. No one has majesty like his. No one has wisdom like his. No one creates and sustains like he does. God is in a class all by himself. As R.C. Sproul put it, God is an infinite cut above everything else. He is so far above and beyond us that he seems almost totally foreign to us. We can't even comprehend this holiness. It's unlike anything we've ever encountered. 
Isaiah is back on this theme again in chapter 46. Flip over a few pages to Isaiah 46, verse 5. Isaiah 46, 5. To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we would be alike? God is speaking again. Who are you going to compare with me, God says? Who is like me? Who is my equal? Verse 6, those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale hire a goldsmith, and he makes it into a god. They bow down, indeed they worship it. They lift it upon the shoulder and carry it. They set it in its place, and it stands there. It does not move from its place. Though one may cry to it, it cannot answer. It cannot deliver him from his distress. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Here God says, okay, let's talk about idols. You want to talk about gods? You want to talk about these, these supposed gods that are so powerful that you're afraid of, that you bow down and worship? Guess where they come from? Somebody makes them. Somebody makes them out of silver and gold. And these gods of the nations, these gods worshipped by all these false religions of the world, they're man-made gods with no power whatsoever. They can't be compared to the true and living God. They have to be carried around. I mean, can you imagine having to carry your God? What kind of foolishness is that? What kind of weak God do you have if you have to pick him up and carry him for him to go places? They have to be set in place so they don't fall over. Maybe you've driven down Greenway Road and seen that big statue of Buddha in the front yard of that house there on Greenway Road. You know, it's got to have that big base, that big pedestal, so it doesn't fall over. And guess what? You can drive by there any time of day. Buddha ain't going anywhere. He's not moving. If, they, if he gets moved in the yard, it's because the owners picked him up and carried him. He's sitting there. I'd love to drive down Greenway Road sometime and see him face down with his hands and his legs cut off. <laughs> if you don't get that, you can read 1 Samuel 4 later today and you'll understand. <laughs> These false gods can't answer prayers. They can't deliver from danger. They're, they're totally useless. And so the true God says in verse 9, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. And it's amazing, Isaiah, after seeing the vision of the exalted Christ and his holiness in the temple seated on the throne, that is burned into his mind the holiness of God. He never lost sight of the holiness of God the rest of his life. And over and over and over again, he reminds us there is no one like this God high and exalted and lifted up in holiness. That's why people who have encountered the living God can never say, well, I worship Jesus, but I also respect Buddha and Muhammad and the gods of Hinduism and karma, and, and I've got this whole pain. I, I just respect all of them, just covering all my bases. If you do that, you have not met Jesus Christ. No one who has encountered the holiness of God has any respect for false gods. Because we understand there is no one like the Lord. Now, the great problem in humanity is we don't grasp this. Look at Psalm 50. Psalm 50, verse 21. These things you have done, and I kept silence. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. God is speaking to the wicked here. And they've, there's a whole list of things to come before this that they've done in secret. And the thought of the wicked is, hey, we're getting away with it. God hasn't judged us yet. God hasn't zapped us from heaven with some divine judgment. And, and so God must be just like us, wicked, arbitrary, unwilling to judge. God isn't responding the way we think he would respond to wickedness in the time we think that he would respond to wickedness. And so nothing's going to happen. Everything's going to be all right. But God has other plans. And God reminds them that the reason they think this, the reason they practice wicked things is because they have the wrong God. They think that God is just like them. But God is not subject to the whims of creatures. God is not like us. And so if God does not judge on our timetable, that should never come as a surprise to us because if there's one thing we know about God, it's that he's not like us. He doesn't think like we think. He doesn't do what we think he should do. 
He's not subject to our whims and our thoughts and our ideas. And, and one man had to learn this the hard way in the Old Testament. Look at 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman comes. He wants to be healed from his leprosy. And so he comes to Elisha wanting to be healed. And Elisha doesn't even visit Naaman personally. He just sends a messenger. And the messenger comes to Naaman and says, hey, listen, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be healed. Seems like an easy enough task, right? Naaman's response is in verse 11. Or his initial response anyways. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, behold, I thought... He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand all over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Can I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. You see Naaman's problem here? Naaman's problem is he thinks he can control God. He thinks God is like him. And so Naaman's thought process is, look, if I were God... And someone came to me for healing, I would make a big deal about it. I would send my prophet, I'd have him stand up, I'd have him do some big incantation and call on the name of his God and say the magic words and wave his hand all over the place and, and it would be this big show of, of healing. What do you mean go wash in the Jordan River? What kind of pedestrian thing is that? That's not what I would do if I were God. You hear this kind of stuff all the time from unbelievers, don't you? Well, if God really wanted to reveal himself to me, then he would do this. Then he would do that. Well, actually, no, he wouldn't. Because he's not like you. And he doesn't do things the way you think they should be done. Whatever you think you would do if you were God, you can be certain God will not do that thing. Because your ideas are terrible. And so are mine. God is not like us. He makes this clear again in Isaiah 55. Turn over to Isaiah 55. Verse 8. For my thoughts, the Lord says, are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Here the Lord is saying, look, we don't think the same. We don't act the same. Uh, I am in a class all by myself. And lest we think that it's all different but equal. I mean, God has his way and that's good. We have our way and that's good. And God way, God's way is just different. No. Verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Your ways of solving problems and doing things are so inferior to God's that they're, they're as far as the heavens are from the earth. In other words, they're an infinite distance apart. God is incomparably preeminent above us. And what God knows and what God does and what God thinks are so far beyond us, so far above us, so infinitely greater than anything that we could ask, think, or imagine that there is no comparison between us and God. It is so crucial we not forget the holiness of God. And the holiness of God, beloved, is why we can never reason from man to God. We can never begin with ourselves and what we think and assume we will wind up thinking what God thinks. We must never begin with what the culture thinks about something and think that that is what God thinks about that thing. And you can take any subject you want. I, don't, I mean, you can take anything that is a modern conversation in contemporary culture. Marriage, parenting, evangelism, the church, morality, sexuality, politics, ethnicity, government, on and on. Pick any topic you want. And you cannot begin with what men think and conclude because that's the popular consensus. Because that's what common sense tells us that that's what God thinks. You cannot begin with what we value and conclude that because our culture values this or that, then God values it the same way that we do. So many people, even people in the church, begin with how they think. And then they assume that God must then agree with them. What they think love is, God must think love is. What they think is just, God must think is just. And they begin with their own conceptions of these things, and, and they, they have such a high view of themselves, they think they are so righteous and so holy, that if God doesn't agree with them, it's because God has a lower standard. 
And they stand in judgment of God. But we must never begin with what we think, what our culture thinks, what the world thinks. You say, how do we know the right way? How do we know how God thinks? There's only one way to know that, and that's from his word. We must begin with scripture and reason from God to man. One pastor put it this way, God created us in his image, and we've been returning the favor ever since. Our natural inclination is to make God in our image and forget that we have been made in the image of God and we must reason from God to man. If God is not like us and we begin with ourselves and think we'll find God, we'll find a God. It just won't be the true God. It will be an idol we have made. Now this is why this incomparable greatness And preeminence of God is why the incarnation of the Son of God is such an incredible miracle. Because somehow, the Son of God, who is incomparably preeminent, became one of us. Somehow, he left heaven and became human. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, defines this mystery like this. And he, speaking of the Son, is the radiance of his, speaking of the Father, his glory. And the exact representation of his nature. And upholds all things by the word of his power. That is an incredible statement. Jesus, the incarnate son of God, is the exact representation of God's nature to us. He perfectly reveals God to us. And what's fascinating about reading the life of Jesus in the Gospels. I I love reading through the, the life of Christ in the Gospels. And over and over again, when people encounter Jesus, they say the same thing. No one speaks like this man. No one acts like this man. No one has ever done what this man does. No one is like this man. And somehow, God, in his incomparable preeminence, became man in the person of his son. And he didn't lose his incomparable preeminence because even though Jesus was one of us, everyone who encountered Jesus said he looks like one of us, but he is obviously not exactly one of us. We've never met anybody like this. We've never encountered anyone like this man. And this is, I think, the greatest miracle and the greatest mystery in the entire Bible, how the incomparably preeminent God could become man. The coming of the Son of God into the world should not diminish God's holiness in our eyes. It should magnify God's holiness in our eyes. So many people take the incarnation of the Son of God and say, well, now God is familiar. No. He is still supremely other, supremely majestic, incomparably preeminent. And the incarnation doesn't reduce that. It increases us. It it, it increases it because what God has entered into the world to become man and save his people from their sins. When we think about the incarnation of Jesus Christ, our response to that should be, who is like our God? Who does this? Who gives up the glory of heaven and comes into a filthy, sin-stained, lowly, dirty world, lives among sinners, dies on a Roman cross, and rises again on their behalf? There's no one like our God. And the incarnation of the Son of God puts an exclamation point on the holiness of God. It does not diminish it in the slightest. We see God's holiness in his incomparable preeminence. Second, we see his holiness manifested in his incorruptible purity. His incorruptible purity. This speaks to God's perfect righteousness. His perfect justice. It means God does not do anything evil. God does not think anything evil. God is not tempted by evil. There is no hint of darkness in God at all. He is pure light, pure righteousness, pure goodness. And when we think about holiness, this is probably the the most natural place our mind goes. We think God is holy, that means God is righteous. God does the right things. God is morally pure, and he is incorruptibly so. And Scripture bears this out. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter quotes Leviticus 19.2 and verse 16. God is the standard of holiness. 
He is the standard of our conduct. And Peter's emphasis here doesn't lie so much on God's otherness and majesty as it does on God's perfect righteousness. He says in verse 14, as obedient children. In other words, being holy for us means being obedient to God. Reflecting his righteous standard, his ordinances, his commands. We are to be holy in all our behavior. And, and so this is a, uh, the way that we act in this world is to reflect who God is. We're not to be conformed to our former lusts from when we were unbelievers. We're not to act like people who are ignorant of God's standard of righteousness and, and who are living in rebellion against God. But we are to be holy and righteous in our behavior. Now this means then that God is holy in all that he does. God is righteous in all that he does. Whatever God does is right, it is just, it is perfect. God is the standard of moral perfection. The prophet Habakkuk had to wrestle with this in Habakkuk chapter 1. In Habakkuk chapter 1. Habakkuk received a word from the Lord that the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, were coming to bring God's judgment upon the nation of Judah. And Habakkuk agreed with God that the nation of Judah deserved to be judged because they were wicked. No question about it. But his hang-up with this revelation he received from the Lord was that the Chaldeans deserved judgment even worse than Judah. Judah. And so how could God bring a nation more wicked than Judah against Judah to bring judgment on Judah? That didn't make sense to the prophet. And so in verse 12, he says this of chapter 1, Habakkuk 1, 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? Notice how he calls God holy. That is his refuge, the holiness of God. God will do what is right. We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Habakkuk is wrestling with this, and, and he is able to come to terms with this as he wrestles because God is holy. And that means that God never approves of any wickedness. God never looks on any evil with favor. In the moment, it felt to Habakkuk like God was doing that. It felt like God was approving of the Chaldeans. But God never approves of wickedness. And even when God brings a wicked nation to judge another wicked nation, and even when the nation that is doing the judging is more wicked than the nation being judged, God is not approving of the wickedness of that nation. Say, so how do we know that? Because God is holy. And God never looks on any kind of wickedness with favor. He never approves of evil because of his purity, his holiness. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. It's not just that God always does what is right, and once in a while God's like, you know, I would love to just do something wrong, but I won't. No, God is never tempted by evil. He never wants to do evil. There's nothing in him that is drawn to evil at all. He, he is so far from evil, so separate from evil, that not only is he never tempted to do evil, but he never tempts anyone else to do evil either. You know, when you're a kid, you're growing up, there's always some naughty thing you want to do, right? And you're too scared to do it. And you know that there's some kid in class at school or one of your siblings or a friend who is foolish enough to do it. And you kind of want to see it done and find out what happens and see them get in trouble. And so you tempt them to do some type of evil, wicked thing. And for, for me, as for many firstborns, that kid was my little brother. You know, let's just send him out. And find out what happens. And, uh, you know, if he gets caught and he gets in trouble, then we laugh at him and say, well, you know, what a stupid thing he did. And then if he doesn't get caught, you say, well, maybe I can do that too, right? And you work up the nerve to go out and do it. Regardless of the outcome, we have this twisted satisfaction, don't we, in, in, in finding somebody that, that maybe is a little bit innocent or naive or, or a little bit more impetuous and, and tempting them to do evil, enticing them to go do something that, that we would never do, but we kind of want to live vicariously through them doing evil, and then we, we, we get a kick out of it when they get in trouble. But God is never like that. 
God never looks at somebody and says, you know, I can't do evil, but man, wouldn't it be great if I could live vicariously through this person doing evil? I'm going to tempt them to do some evil. God gets no satisfaction from evil at all. He, he, has, he wants nothing to do with it ever. God is incorruptibly pure. Jesus put it this way, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You say, how righteous is God? How holy is God? He's perfectly righteous, perfectly holy. There's no imperfection in his holiness at all. And your responsibility is to imitate that moral perfection to be perfect as he is perfect. Now understand this. God is not grading on the curve. God's not looking at us and comparing us to other people. God's not looking at you and saying, well, you know, they're doing better than the person sitting next to them at church. Or they're doing better than the person sitting in front of them in the pew in front of them or behind them. God is not grading on the curve. In fact, you could be the most righteous sinner on earth. And compared to other sinners, you might be really good. But compared to God's standard of holiness, you are wretched and vile. And so am I. That's what was so shocking to Moses and Isaiah and Peter. They didn't realize how sinful they were until they saw the holiness of God. When they looked around at other people, they probably felt like pretty good guys. They weren't tax collectors or prostitutes. They weren't idolaters. They weren't Gentiles. They weren't the, undesirable of, uh, the undesirables of society. They weren't criminals. They were pretty good people. They were salt of the earth, good guys. Worked hard, were good to other people, raised families, did all the good things that a good Israelite was supposed to do. And all of that melted to nothing when they encountered the holiness of God. At that moment, the only person they compared themselves to was God. And in that comparison, they were utterly undone because of how far short they fell of God's perfection in holiness. That's why Peter told Jesus, go away. That's why Isaiah said he was disintegrated. That's why Moses hid his face in fear of God. And the biggest problem in our culture today is that people think they're generally good people because they've never encountered the holiness of God. The rich young ruler ran smack into this problem in Luke 18. In Luke 18, verse 18, a ruler questioned Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He comes to Jesus and he thinks he's good. And he thinks he can flatter his way into the kingdom and he can work his way into the kingdom of God. He says, what good thing do I have to do to get into the kingdom of God? What mountain do I have to climb? What charity do I have to support? What, what good work do I need to do? What sacrifice do I need to offer? Tell me what it is that I need to do to get into the kingdom. Uh, what is it that, that it would be the cherry on top of my very good life? Jesus confronts him in verse 19. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. That stops this young man dead in his tracks. At the end of the encounter, he went away sad. He realized he wasn't the good person he thought he was. And the young man didn't know the first thing about being good. Because he thought he could be good enough to, eternal, to earn eternal life. He thought he had kept the commandments of God. And Jesus threw cold water on that and said, no one is good but God. God stands utterly alone and unique in his goodness. As long as you think you are generally a good person, you cannot inherit eternal life. Just about everyone we meet in the world today is like this rich young ruler. They think there's something good they can do to inherit eternal life. They think if they take up this or that social cause or if they support this or that political position or if they give to this or that charity, then they will be good people fit for eternal life. And the only reason anyone ever thinks they're a good person who is worthy of eternal life is because they have not encountered the holiness of God. People will object to eternal punishment all the time. I don't understand why a good God would send good people to hell just because they didn't believe in him. God doesn't send good people to hell. He's too holy for that. God sends sinners to hell. And the only reason people think those who are destined for eternal condemnation under the wrath of God are good people is because they're measuring them by the wrong standard. 
There are no good people. God alone is good. And if you think to yourself, well, I'm a, I'm a good, I don't deserve hell. I mean, I, I'm not perfect, but I don't deserve hell. You have not encountered the holiness of God. God is holy. He is pure. And we have to declare to the unbelievers in our culture today, not that God wants them to have a better life, not that God wants to help them with their marriage or their children or their families or their problems, not that God wants them to be all that they can be, but that God is holy and they are standing on the precipice of hell because they are wicked people who deserve divine judgment. Listen, no one hides his face from a God who wants you to be all you can be. If that scared people away, the army wouldn't use it to recruit. No one says they are utterly disintegrated and ruined before a God who wants them to have their best life now and fix all their problems. And when we preach such gods, we must realize that we are telling sinners just to trade in one idol for another because that's not the God of the Bible. When Paul went into one of the most pagan places in the Roman world and preached the gospel, listen to what he said in Acts 17, verse 30. Therefore, Paul said, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Paul did not go into Athens. He did not go into Mars Hill and say, you know what, there's a God out there who wants you to be all you can be. Who wants to solve your problems and fix your life and, and make you a, a, a happy person and make you healthy and wealthy and, and all those things. No, Paul came into Athens and said, there is a God who is going to judge you by righteousness. And he has proved that by raising his son from the dead. Therefore, you need to repent or that judgment's going to come upon you. That's the gospel that Paul preached. That's the God that Paul preached. A holy God. A God who brings righteous judgment, but a God who also offers salvation from that wrath through the man he raised from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the God we proclaim. Not a salvation from some temporary problem or from a lack of self-realization. In fact, I'll tell you today that if you decide to follow Christ, your life might very well get harder, not easier. Normally, when you pick up a cross, that does not make your life easier, does it? You'll be more full of joy, more full of love, more full of peace because you'll have the Holy Spirit within you. But your temporal situation may very well get worse because you are now in the fight if you're not a believer, life, I mean, you're, you're just going with the flow. You're not fighting against anything. But when you come to Christ, you're now in the battle. You're on the wrong side of the world. But this is the God who is. He is holy. Finally, God's holiness is manifest in his infinite perfections. His infinite perfections. Now, what, what we're saying here is that God's holiness is not just one attribute among many. We might say, well, God is holy and God is love. God is holy and God is just, or these types of things. We don't separate holiness from all of God's other perfections. And this is borne out in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, which you perhaps remember from last week. When the angel, one angel, sang to another in Isaiah 6, 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And he repeats three times this word, holy. This is of central and critical importance. When someone in Scripture wanted to emphasize something, they usually repeated it. Remember how Jesus would say, truly, truly, I say to you. And when Jesus said, truly, truly, he repeated it. Why? He's saying, hey, listen up. Pay attention. I'm about to tell you something of profound importance. So, so if, you were, if you were out on a mental vacation for the last few minutes of that sermon, come on back. Truly, truly, I say to you, I'm about to, t I'm about to drop some pearls of wisdom and you better tune in. Now, a threefold repetition is extremely rare. And it doesn't mean something that is merely important or profound, but something that is superlative, that passes all other things. R.C. Sproul notes that only once in sacred scripture is an attribute of God elevated to the third degree. The Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says that God is love, love, love. 
or mercy, 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 or wrath, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It does say that he is holy, holy, holy. What's the point? It means that everything about God is defined by his holiness. Every single one of his perfections are holy perfections. And we could think about, I mean, we could do a systematic theology class and we could think about all of God's attributes. His love. What kind of love does he have? Holy love. His wrath. What kind of wrath does he have? Holy wrath. His grace. His grace is a holy grace. And, and it's really an amazing thing that God rescued us from sin by grace and he never compromised his holiness because his son paid the penalty for our sins so that his grace is not a, a human grace that just overlooks sin and sweeps it under the rug, but it is a holy grace that not only forgives the sinner but deals with the sin and continues to be just. Because God is a holy justice, God has a holy omnipotence, a holy jealousy, a holy patience, a holy kindness. Anything that is true of God is holy. All of his infinite perfections are holy. That means that all of these perfections of God are infinitely greater than our manifestation of them. Where do you learn about love? Well, it's not from pop culture. You won't learn anything about love there. If you want to know what love is, you need to know what a holy love is because that's the only real kind of love. And so you start with God and you define love from the word of God. Or you think about grace. What is grace? You, you look to God and you see what real grace is or, or what is appropriate jealousy, what is appropriate wrath as, as a believer. All of these things don't come by looking inside or looking outside. They come by looking at the word of God and seeing how God is these things in a holy way. God's holiness is then manifest in all that he is, in all of his infinite perfections. When we talk about God's holiness, I hope you've seen today that we can scarcely wrap our minds around it. We can never adequately capture it in human language. You may be sitting there thinking, I don't know that I really understand holiness better now than I did at the beginning of the sermon. And neither do I. And this is an infinitely glorious topic. I mean, how do we ever fully, adequately grasp the, the, the holiness of God? We will forever be seeing his holiness through all eternity being made manifest and wondering at who he is. But we can understand it in measure. We can understand certain important critical truths about it. That God's holiness is manifest in his incomparable preeminence, his incorruptible purity, and his infinite perfections. And this holiness demands our reverent worship. Now, we think about encountering a holy God and we think about what God's holiness means. We rightly begin to think, well, how is it that we can have a relationship with this holy God? How do we understand God's holiness and its interaction with sinful people? And we're going to save that for next time. Let's pray.